Let's fix some toasters. Hello and welcome to the Technology Connections 2 follow-up where we take a look at these three toasters, examine what might go wrong with them and how to fix them, and walk you through how to replace the power cord. I have already replaced the power cord on this guy to a much more modern and safer grounded plug and have correctly hooked up the wiring on the inside so you don't have to worry about getting an electric shock from touching the insides of the toaster, unless of course your outlet is wired backwards, then sucks to be you. This is the exact same toaster model right here, and it has its original power cord, so I will walk you through how to add one of these. It's not very complicated, but it's good to know. Both of these toasters are the Model T35. They were made between like 1958 to 1969 or something like this. This is a much newer version of the same toasters. They moved the uh, shade control to the front so it has a little slider. But as you can probably tell already, it's the exact same body, basically. There's one tiny difference, which is kind of interesting. But other than that, the mechanism is exactly the same. They just modernized uh, the control and changed the handle design, and this is the most, I don't know if this is the most modern version, but it is among the more modern ones. And this one doesn't work, and I can already see why it doesn't work, and it has to do with the tension of the control mechanism, and that is where we will start. We're going to put these two to the side and focus on this toaster, because it will reveal what can go wrong with these and cause them to not work. And the fix is shockingly easy, in probably at least 90% of the cases of this toaster. So let's get going. All right, before we get too excited into fixing this, I just wanted to show you the one weird design difference that appears to have been made at some point, and that is that the text one slice was turned around. Let me take you off the tripod here so you can see it better. So you can see on the toaster in front, which is the older T35, one slice, the one is at the back of the toaster, so it goes back to front as far as how you would read that text. And the newer version, the one is at the front, so they flip that text around. It looks to be the exact same stamping pattern and the exact same, you know, typeface and size. They just, for some reason, turned the words, they flipped them around. Don't know why, but they did that. I almost wonder if that was just an accident when they were making these things, because you can tell that the the shell is exactly the same. Not a lot was changed in how these were built. So I wonder if at some point the die got turned around or if that was intentional. But in any way, in any case, that's not the main attraction of this video. So let's get to the main attraction of this video. All right, so this is looking into the broken toaster and you should, if you understand how these toasters operate, be able to figure out why it doesn't work. In this resting state, you can see that the bread carriage is not at the top, it's kind of hanging out in the middle. If I, it's unplugged, so don't worry. If I stick my fingers down in here, no, well, you won't be able to see anything. Oh, I'll go down on this side. You can see that it, it's not very, there's not a lot of tension on here. So I can lift it up higher, but it falls back down. That is a no-no, and the toaster cannot function in this state because the only way the thermostat is going to trip to start the toaster is if it is all the way at the top. The toaster will not begin unless the carriage is all the way up here because of how the switch is actuated. You can actually see in this footage that I made for the main video, the tension wasn't high enough, so what happens is as the bread falls, it actually moves the carriage down past the point where it can actuate the switch and the switch doesn't get actuated. So oftentimes, if it seems like the toaster is not functioning, it's almost always just the tension. So how do you fix that? On the bottom is, of course, the crumb tray. Now, this, this, uh, this design, late in later years, they used to put a sticker here. And I've seen it on an eBay listing. If it's still there, I will put it up. And the sticker would tell you what you need to do. There's a little set screw right in there. That's what attaches the center core to the toaster. So if you open this up, it's that screw right there. This is a little different on these newer models because this is how the uh, darkness control, this is connected to the lever on the front. That's the linkage that connects it to the actual thermostat on the side. But in any case, this screw right here affects the tension of the actual mechanism because it's, you know, it's pulling on the center core or pushing on it at all times. So in its resting state, it needs to be quite taut. And in the case of this toaster, it isn't, so let's get a screwdriver. Ta-da! So, in this case, you actually want to loosen the screw, if I'm not mistaken. There we go. I'm gonna loosen it a bunch of turns because I know that this is just 
not at all in the right shape. We'll turn it upside down and take a look at that. Now the carriage is at the top. It's where it's supposed to be. This has still not got much tension on it. I can easily move it with my hands in a good toaster. So this toaster back here, which is working, and again, don't worry, it's unplugged. This is kind of tense. In fact, this is a good way to check it. If you put your hand down and let it go, it should snap back up pretty quick. This is almost there. In fact, it might actually work, and let's plug it in and try it out. Oh boy. It hasn't run in a long time. But it did, it is in the trip position. So you can tell that um, it's burning a lot of dust off of the heating elements. Now I just have to hope that it actually trips. Perfect. So now you can really tell the tension's not quite right because it's taking a long time for the carriage to come back up, but it is moving. So that's an improvement. And by the way, that was the first time I've ever plugged in this toaster, if it wasn't obvious. One of the downsides, which I did not bring up in the video about these toasters is these slots are actually also a tiny bit shorter than newer toasters. So this wide potato bread loaf doesn't quite fit. I had to cut it down a little bit, but let's see if this will trip when I put it in. Hey, we got somewhere. It didn't really fall all the way down. Let me cancel this. Oh yeah, that's a that's a that's one thing to point out. These newer these newer ones with the slider, the left there is an off position, so you can cancel the toasting operation. Yeah, so it definitely, we need more tension on that no matter what. So let me unplug it again, because you don't want to open that bottom while it's plugged in. I'm going to do one more full turn. This screwdriver is almost too big for this screw. An ancient crumb. So let me check... Oh yeah, that's nice and firm. This is probably about where you want it to be set. So this is working, but it's not quite dropping all the way down to the bottom when you put in the bread. And that may just be because it's kind of bound up from not being used in so long. Let me put another slice on the left-hand side. There we go. Just had a bit of resistance in that spot. So there you go. That's pretty much all that ever goes wrong with these. So what usually happens is the tension gets a little too low, so then there isn't enough downward pressure on the levers which push up on the bread carriage. And so that was obvious when I saw this toaster because the carriage was kind of halfway down. So again, what you want is to have, and I, this is plugged in, so I'm being careful here, is to have tension. You want to have a nice snap back like that. And that would be my, my estimation of how to get these working the best because you need to have enough tension on it so where when one slice of bread is in there, it's still all the way at the top. So that way the action of hitting the trip lever will start the toaster. So this one will probably improve as it gets used more. There's probably just a little bit of gunk somewhere on the levers that are that's causing that resistance when it first falls down. But it is actually working and I should set this somewhere to where it will actually kind of toast the bread and we'll see how it comes out. Starting to smoke a bit.
Well, that was set to about medium. That's a little bit darker, and I had to I had to interrupt it, and that's a bit darker than I would like myself. But I think part of that is because I had to tear the edge off the bread. The sides were definitely getting more burned than they should be. This model, I don't know how to adjust that thermostat slider position. I don't think there is a way to. And I'll kind of get into that when we take apart the other one, which is what we're going to do right now. All right, this is the toaster that we saw in the video put together. The other one that I have already replaced the cord was the one that was taken apart. So we're going to replace this very old tired cord with a newer appliance cord. This is a three prong power supply cord. It is rated for, it's a 16 gauge cord. So I believe that's 1600 Watts, 1625. And these toasters use about 1350 Watts. That's another thing I didn't touch on the video. These toasters are wickedly powerful compared to newer toasters, which you can probably tell by how intensely the elements glow. But uh, the cheaper toast, the newer toasters are usually like 750 Watts. And that partly explains that number makes perfect sense because a four slot toaster, which you can get these days, two of those side by side would be 1500 Watts. And where's that number appeared before? Anyway, so this cord here, I didn't show it to you in the video very closely. This is its end. This is like terrifying. It's nice that it says Sunbeam, but the plug is so small. And you know, one of the criticisms of the American electrical system is that our plugs are kind of unsafe. Well, this is very unsafe because how close you are to the prongs when you're holding this. And there's no, it's just scary. And I mean, it's cracking, it's aged, it should go. So we're gonna make it go. To do that, you need to remove the bottom of the toaster. You don't need to take the toaster completely apart. Uh, and if it's working correctly, I would advise against doing that. But there's a very important thing with these particular toasters, the T35 and the older versions that have this darkness control on the side. The dark, the bounds of the darkness control are set by the plastic, the Bakelite plastic here at the bottom. Is Bakelite plastic incorrect? Whatever you want to say. The Bakelite here, the, the stops from lightest to darkness are part of the plastic shell. So when you take this off, this can just spin around and around and around and you will definitely get the thermostat completely misaligned. So. What you wanna do is set this to one extreme, either dark or light, remember which one you set it to, and you need to remove this before you can take off the bottom anyway. So what do I have this on? I have this on darkest, which is what I have done before. So use a screwdriver to gently pry this off. And again, try to keep it in the whatever position you want it in because now that, it's, now that it's not touching, this will spin in circles. So be careful of that. Okay, now this is off. And to remove the bottom of the toaster, you need to remove the crumb tray because basically the crumb tray and these two screws are holding it all together. Remember that the ones with the washers go on this side. They are otherwise identical screws. And I'm going to assume that this is exactly the same as the one that I just did. However, there is a difference between the two in that the coiled heating elements are constructed differently. I suspect this is a newer version. Uh, but if, the, if it is the same, there's going to be a strain relief kind of built in under here, which is good because we can use that. So to, now that this is unscrewed, you can take the crumb tray completely aside. And this should come right off. You have to lift up a bit and get it around the thermostat. Yes, okay. This is quite a bit different. Okay, there's some ancient crumbs down here. We'll get rid of those. The main difference is that these wires are actually labeled, or actually colored. They were both white in the other one, so they have blue and red. Now that is interesting because that would almost imply that they meant to put in a polarized plug because why would they color code them in any other case? I don't know. But with this strain relief, the way it's designed, we can basically use that with our new cord. And 
the way we're going to attach it is using the same crimp connections that they used here. I don't have um, I don't have ones that are really perfect for this application, but they work well enough. Other thing to keep in mind, the power cord has to go through this Bakelite bottom, and you may have to enlarge the hole that the cord goes through. I had to in the other one. I used a utility knife to scrape it away. This one doesn't, this one looks like the new cord will fit fine. So just keep that in mind. You might need to kind of scrape away a little bit to get it to fit inside there, but you might not. All right, so these are the three connectors we're gonna use. We're gonna use two butt connectors and we need to trim down the sides because these are a little too long and then one ring terminal and this will be for our earth or ground connection. And we have a perfect place to put this thanks to the design of the toaster and I will show you that in a moment. So first things first, we're gonna remove this cord from the strain relief. The strain relief does not, it, it basically just, so when this goes in, it's got a matching recess for it. So it just clamps down the connections. So that's gonna be the most fiddly bit and you will see. I'm gonna get my power cord unpackaged. So we do need to take off a little bit extra of the sheathing here because we need to remove about this much, I'd say, from the other one. And I have this tool which is used for taking off the, well, taking off the sheathing of household wiring. You can do this however you would like, but this tool is pretty nice for this. As you can see, it just carves a slice down there and it doesn't hurt the wires. But then of course you have to get this off and there's really no super elegant way to do that. Okay, that's about as nice as I think I can reasonably get it. So uh, first thing I will do is cut the excess off of these a little bit. We don't need this much. And I'm just using scissors for this because my, my wire stripper and crimp tool has very dull cutting blades. Okay, so now these are cut down to a more reasonable length. And what we can do now already is crimp the uh, spade ring connection, whatever you call this, onto the ground. So I will do that. These uh, crimpers are for 16 to 22 gauge wiring. And of course my crimp tool, 22 and 16 are two different, or it goes 22 to 18, then 16 to 10. So I'm gonna use 22 to 18 because it's a tighter crimp. Squeeze that nice and hard. There's our ground terminal. Where we're gonna put this is right here. Ooh. Ha ha ha! We have a problem. This design is different. Oh. The sides of the toaster are riveted to the central core. In the older toaster, and again, this is confirming my belief that this one's a newer revision, these had screws that we could remove. So we are gonna have to improvise a little bit. I wish I had noticed that a moment ago. No matter, there's two things that we could do. We can either drill another hole into the side here, or if the wire, if it works well enough, I will just snake it to here. What I did in the other toaster was removed this, uh, well actually I had to remove all of them so I could move the clamshell out, stick the ground lead between the two of them and just screw it back together. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit different. One thing that we could do, but it's gonna be really hard to do, to get it aligned when you put this back together. You could put it here where the screw goes to put the bottom back on the toaster, but it's, it's rather difficult to do it that way. Oh boy, okay, well, let's move forward then. We will remove these old connections. I'm going to try to basically uncrimp this to save as much of the original wire as I can because we don't have a lot of extra here. Oh man, this is probably impossible. These are much firmer crimps than the other one. Okay, this is the only one that we have enough extra on the red wire but on the blue wire, we really don't have a lot. Oh, this, is a, this is annoying. Let's see what I can get to have happen. Yep, okay, well that just broke it off. Just repeat on this side then. Okay, that will make things slightly more difficult. But again, 
since when have things gone easily? So this is the most annoying thing about this process is that you have to feed your power cord through here the whole time you're doing this because there's no, there's no other way to do it. So we will get our newer power cord, which by the way, I didn't mention, this is only a three foot lead. You could, do, you could get a longer lead, uh, but when I was buying these, the only, one thing that I did consider doing was there was a 20 foot extension cord like this that was white. And I could cut that down to like six feet, which is about what the original cord length is. But I got to thinking, you know, it's going to be better if it's black. This is actually an appliance cord. And um, the other thing is, with it being three feet, that's kind of like what toasters kind That's That seems more modern now. If you buy a new toaster, they have a rather short cord. I'm not sure why exactly, but probably something to do with safety. So we'll, we'll do that. But we have to feed our cord through the hole. And yeah, we will not need to enlarge the hole on this one at all. And now I will put my butt connectors, <laughs> but these ones, the way they're made, they have to have the ends taken off because they're too long otherwise. And actually I would prefer if I had non-insulated butt connectors because they're gonna be smaller. I don't know how much heat the insulation on these can tolerate, but I will suppose a fair amount. It's a, it's a definitely, it's for electrical work. If this is horrendously unsafe, please let me know in the comments, but I mean, what was there before, it's definitely, I'm basically replacing what was there before. These just happen to be insulated. And judging by the fact that this is a Bakelite piece, I don't really think heat is that important right here. It is, after all, on the bottom of the toaster, and heat likes to go up. So now I need to strip a bit off of here. One of my, uh, one of the patrons that has early access to the video thought that maybe these, this insulation might be asbestos. I don't think it is. It really seems like it's just a paper insulation. What I should do is see if it burns, because I don't think asbestos would burn. That is two layered insulation, actually. There is a rubber or some sort of second layer under here. And this is the same too. It looks to be that this lead is aluminum and this lead is copper. And I wonder if the reason why is because this lead is actually going directly to a heating element and this one is going to a switch. I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if I read, in, read far into the patent if that would be elucidated there. But again, I don't know. So we're gonna put the strain relief about where it should go. And get a butt connector. And I don't wanna, I wanna, cause there's so little extra, extra room now, very on there. And again, this goes to, so this looks a little counterintuitive. I should probably stop and explain this. This lead is going to the switch. Uh, it, it goes around, so this is where the hot wire should go. So if you are in the US, that's the black lead. Um, I think it's the same in Canada. And I have no idea if these toasters were ever made in to, to go in Europe. And there's pretty, well, actually, that's a great question. You could, in theory, because of how simple this toaster is, if you got a high-powered diode, you could convert these to 110. I have no idea if that is safe at all, so probably, I don't know if that's wise, but what you could do is you, if you halfway rectified its power supply, it could be run on 240 and work pretty much exactly as it should in the US. So if anyone wants to try that, be my guest, but um, I really don't know if you could get, I mean, I know diodes exist that can handle this much current, but, um, where you would put it. I don't know if you could put it in the toaster or if you'd have to put it in like the power cord somewhere. But the fact that this really is just one switch controlling the whole toaster, you probably could convert this to work on 240 without too much difficulty. Okay, our hot connection is now crimped on. Now we will do our neutral. You are kind of at a space premium for this whole operation, which stinks a little bit. Ooh, this is hard to do with your left hand. Okay, so now the toaster should work, and what we can do, we could test it. Uh, 
actually, since it's not taken apart, it's going to be really difficult to test it. So let's just continue. <laughs> Skip on over that. So now we can put the strain relief back and hope that there was enough excess wiring for this to kind of go where it's supposed to. It's going to be tight, but it should work. Ah, ha, no. I thought you would be the better one. Okay, hang on. Okay, that crimp failed, so we're doing this again. I'm going to try to double crimp it. It's just I have so little excess room here that I'm worried about. And I did re -double, I did double crimp it on the other one. I don't know how that will change things. Oh, that's not really on there much. Hopefully that holds better. One of the uh, one of the things that just sucks about the design of the the strain relief is just how you know kind of difficult this is. Now in theory, I don't have to use the same strain relief. I could do so, use a completely different solution for this. But the thing is, if I were to do something else, I need to get some sort of terminal block so it's you know insulated from the body of the toaster. And the strain relief that it has, honestly, would work pretty good. But they gave you like no extra space at all. And to be fair, this is not the best tool. These are not the best crimp or butt connectors, butt connectors. Okay, so again, we will put these back where they go. Try to keep the ground lead out of the way. Okay, and see the point of this, the reason why it's snaking like this is so that way when this cord is pulled, it doesn't actually, this 90 degree bend means that it, it's pulling, it's not pulling on the actual leads. That's why they call it a strain relief. And so if you wanted to, you could get rid of this, but the other challenge is that the, the bottom of this is molded to accommodate it. And so if you do, you might need to get a angle grinder or a Dremel tool, or not angle grinders, a little overkill, but a Dremel tool and cut this out and do some sort of other, because I mean, what you could do is actually use the insulated butt connectors like I had, use them where they are actually, the insulation is sticking out on the sides and tap them to the bottom of this. The only big consideration with this is it's a toaster and it gets hot. So whatever you do, it needs to be pretty resilient to um, heat. But now this is essentially, the, the wiring is now modernized, except we haven't put our ground lead anywhere useful yet. And so where I would like to put it, and this is where it gets a little challenging. Oh, I forgot my, uh, hang on. So what I'm gonna do is undo this screw. and stick that in the middle and put the screw back. Now it's a very solid earth connection and also just the other reason why this is a great place to put it is because it's sandwiched between the actual inner core and the outer shell. It's connected to both of them. Even though because of all those screws, it would be wherever you put it, but I just like how this works out. But the, the challenge here is Snaking this somewhere, and this is probably the best avenue. And see now it pulled out. Ah, crap, it pulled this out. Ah! We're gonna leave the ground wire where it is. <sighs> okay, after much, after many attempts here, let's hope we did this well enough. Okay. <laughs> This is now to the point where it should be able to be reassembled. The ground lead is snaking right here. There's actually a little bit of a gap in the sheet metal, which almost makes me wonder if they had planned for a ground lead to go at some point. And these connections are as good as I can reasonably get them using uh, butt crimps like I have used. Uh, the, 
The, the real bummer about this is, again, just how short these wires are. It would be nice to be able to extend them. This design of the strain relief, I think, is actually pretty decent. The only real challenge is the wires like to pop out, and we're going to have to manipulate this end of it a bit to get the back of it on. This is going to go better than the last time because the hole for the cord in here is much larger. So it'll actually move more smoothly. But now the challenge is we got to get it back on there and see they've already popped out. This is the most frustrating step is putting this back on. So be prepared for this nonsense. You kind of have the ability to use this as like a lev, like a shelf. Here, let me take a picture with my phone so you can see what this looks like better. But the problem is this end needs to go on first to get around the darkness control. So you kind of have to just hope for the best. <laughs> it's, it's really all you're doing. And you do it like when, once you get the third, here, I'll sh you, I should just stop talking and get to that point. Now that this end is on, you can lift this up a bit. It's hard to get a good angle to see. And like, you're not gonna be able to see it all, but you can lift it up and make sure that everything's kind of in place. And lucky enough, it is. The ground is going where we want it to go. Everything appears to be where it should be. Now the only, the only, yeah, the only thing right now is just there's, there's a little bit of tension. I want to make sure that it's not, yeah, hang on now. The wires are completely out of the strain relief. Like I said, this is, this is not really easy. It's rather fidgety and frustrating. And you just got to be patient and keep trying. And the problem is because every time you, you have to lift this up to, to get the thermostat put in. And because you have to do that, it's going to pull the wires out of the strain relief. So I guess the best thing to do is to try to keep your fingers where I have them, get the thermostat over. I'm still not confident that that went smoothly. Okay, this is actually probably the best way to do this. That took a while, but it's now in place. I Lifting it on the side like that, I could see how things look. Now you can put it back together. You can start with these two screws and this is actually an excellent place to start because you can make sure that it's going together correctly. And this is gonna really squeeze down on all the wires in there and definitely keep it from moving around. At this point, if you'd like, you can test this. Just leave the crumb tray off. And now let me show you. In fact, let's test it. Now, because we've put a ground lead on it, the advantage is that if there is a short anywhere in here that would cause the uh, wires to touch the metal chassis, it should instantly trip your circuit breaker because it's gonna be a dead short to ground. That's the whole reason we added a ground is so that way the metal body is always connected to ground, to earth, as you might say in other countries. And then if there is some sort of electrical fault, it should either trip your GFCI outlet, if it's plugged into one of those, your RCD, if you have one of those in your panel, or just the good old fashioned circuit breaker, because hopefully enough current will go right through to electromagnetically trip your breaker. But let's plug it in and hope we don't die. So far, so good. I think we've done it. It's safe to touch the sides now. And everything looks hunky-dory. And now, because the plug is wired correctly, we don't have to worry about the uh, internal elements being live unless your outlet is wired backwards and hopefully you've either tested them to figure that out or, you know, you just know that they aren't. But let's trip it again with the screwdriver. And 
and now I would consider this toaster much safer to use. I don't think the uh, with a non-polarized plug it's really that terribly dangerous, but without a ground I'd be a little uneasy using this day to day. Just because there's a lot of places, as I showed in the original video, where wiring is going right next to the body of the toaster. And, you know, just with modern safety standards, you don't need a ground on many appliances because they're double insulated, meaning any anywhere that there is insulation, there's another layer of insulation. So you have a fallback. This is single insulated and very old and entirely metal. So definitely want a ground connection there. So let me unplug it. Boop. The only real downside to the way that strain relief works is you have so little room. Like basically it's right inside here. So where I had to cut the insulation, you can see the wire, the interior wire a little bit. So this is frankly, there's no way to use a cord like this unless you're extremely careful where you won't be able to see the cut that you made on the outer sheath. So if that's concerning to you, what I would do is I would completely redo the wiring in here. I would just take out the strain relief as it currently exists and do a sort, you know, do use those butt connectors as they are insulated, tie them down to the bottom of the toaster frame and, uh, look for look for some butt connectors or whatever that have a high temperature tolerance and that's definitely an option if you don't want to use the strain relief in here as it exists uh, not all of these toasters are going to have that strain relief some of them have um, completely different they have like a terminal block on the older designs i've seen um, and those may or may not be better or worse for you know for your application but definitely I trust this toaster much more now that it has a ground on it and I'm not so afraid to, you know, I wouldn't be afraid to use this as an everyday toaster. And that's really all you need to do. It's just, you know, you need to have some patience because as you saw the butt connectors, they can fail. If you, and really, I've, I just wish I had a better tool because I'm sure if I had a newer tool than this ancient thing, it would work a little better. And the other thing is I'd be comfortable actually soldering new connections onto there rather than using a crimp connector. That might have been a better way to do it. Uh, but it's just because you have a solid core wire inside the toaster and a stranded core wire in the power cord, I don't, mm, I'm more comfortable using a crimp connector in that situation. Maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe it would be better to solder in either way, but this is, this at least tells you how to do it. Do it to your own standards. And then the other thing to consider is that with the toaster repaired like this, you know, you may still not want to leave this plugged in all the time. Um, I personally am pretty okay with that because I know, how, I know with the circuit design, with it open like this, and now that it's polarized, there's only, um, there's, when it's plugged in, there's only going to be power going right there. And the rest of it's going to be, uh, the rest of it's going to be dead. And the worst situation that would occur is if there is a short to ground somewhere, well, now that it's grounded, you know, you don't have to worry about the toaster um, really hurting you. And also, definitely, if it's plugged into a GFCI outlet, which all kitchens in the United States should have those in their kitchens now, if you don't consider upgrading them, it's not hard to do, then basically the risks involved in using this toaster are mainly down to how hot it gets when it's in operation. Electrically, it's pretty safe now. In my opinion, uh, you may not think so. And you know what, that's totally within your tolerance so, you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sit here and say this toaster is definitely safe to use you know let's be frank it's an old design it's got one single switch it does it's not a double pull switch and we've made it much safer but uh i am pretty confident that the eight dollar and 88 cent walmart toaster is safer than this one even though it's not grounded because the whole thing's plastic it's got double insulation everywhere and it trips both the hot and neutral side. So pretty much all the risks that you have with this toaster are eliminated with even the cheapest newer toasters. But we've eliminated the uh, most dangerous risks. And quite frankly, I think that now, in my opinion, 
this is safe to use as an everyday toaster. Last thing we really need to do to put it together are put the darkness control knob back on. And remember we had it set all the way to darkest. So we're gonna put it back on just like that and push it in all the way. And now it's in those bounds and we haven't messed up the actual settings. And then it's just a matter of putting those, these four screws back and it's completely back together. All right, and the last thing I wanted to do was I've taken apart the, this is the new toaster. And the reason why I wanted to do this is I could see, it's not the new, this is the newer version of the toaster. I could see there are two wires going to this side. I believe these might be protected against a miswired outlet. I think they might actually have two switch contacts now on the thermostat, so I want to check it out. But already I've discovered something. There is a way to adjust these thermostats. I didn't notice there's another, there is a small hole in the bottom plastic housing exactly where the um, thermostat control used to be. So this slider is just actuating this little bit here. And the, um, let's see, one of these positions is off. I don't know exactly how that how that works, but you can, there is a set screw here that you can turn to adjust the thermostat. If the lightest setting is like really dark, you could back that off. So it is adjustable. Interestingly, the strain relief is exactly the same. So they, that, they stuck to that design. Really the only difference is the bottom is now made of a true plastic. Oh, you can't see it. The bottom is now made of a truer plastic. It's not Bakelite anymore. But I want to get this side off so I can see what the thermostat what the switching situation is because I have a hunch that it is actually double pole switched and if that's the case then these ones aren't quite as scary I wouldn't worry about you know uh, the plug not being polarized oh and also I was gonna say these are kind of a pain in the butt to take apart because the entire where did this screw go? Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> I freaked myself out a little bit. The, the entire thing is held together basically by tension. And these new ones are probably not as bad because the sides are riveted on, but they're not, taking them apart is very easy, but putting them back together, not so much. Yep, it's got two switch poles. Let me see. Let me move you so you can see it. I really have to boost the ISO, so apologies there, but you can see, hopefully, there is, yeah, right there. There is a pair of switch, well, two pairs of switch contacts. So both the neutral side and the hot side are switched. So these newer designs, the fact that they don't have a polarized plug is not as bad because they do have uh, they do have double pole switching. So honestly, with these newer ones, I wouldn't worry about adding a ground. Well, I don't know. The ground wire, these have newer, you know, cloth type wires. I'm more confident in their insulation than whatever is in the other one. I'm pretty confident that's just paper. Some people uh, it was suspected it might be asbestos. I think I already said that, but anyway, so these, these newer designs that have the slider, what, well, actually I wouldn't, I shouldn't say that because maybe the oldest slider ones do have a design, but you can look through the crumb tray and if you see two wires going from this side, then that's probably a good sign that it's got a double pull switch on the thermostat side because this this is the hot wire going to the thermostat. And then this is the neutral wire going to the thermostat and then back to inside the toaster. And that's what I suspected this was. And now that I've taken it apart, I am completely sure. So that's one thing to consider. The newer designs are electrically safer. You don't have to worry about the plug not being polarized because there is a double pull switch. So really the only way to improve this would be to add a ground. Um, 
and that's up to you whether or not you want to do that. But it, it has the same strain relief, which is both like, I don't know. It's good because it means you can follow pretty much the instructions that I just did, but I don't particularly like how difficult this is to, to deal with. So that's it. Now you know how to get one of these toasters working if for some reason it won't. Uh, I would say, you know, it's not like that's the adjustment of the tension screw is the only thing that can go wrong, but it, it honestly seems like that's what it is 90% of the time. Um, other things, uh, like I said, I would definitely use a grounded plug on the older ones, the T35. So basically, I should have gone over this. If the thermostat is on the end like this and it has the gold Sunbeam logo on the front or it has an Art Deco pattern, that's the first version, that's the T20, then these ones definitely have a single pull switch and you should ground it and definitely, or I should say, I would prefer that you ground it, you should definitely add a polarized plug. The newer ones with the slider, I don't know if they all have um, a double pull switch. Uh, the first one that moved to a slider, I think it was called Sunbeam Vista, so you should take a look at that. Uh, but look in the crumb tray, if you see two wires going, I should say three wires total, spanning that distance, then you know it's probably got a double pull switch because there's no reason for the neutral to go to the thermostat side and back unless it has a double pull switch. Um, but yeah, that's about it. So replacing the cord, it's it's finicky. It's not very involved, but it's kind of finicky. What um, I might have done, and what you could totally do if you want to go and make these even more safer, is you can replace the internal wiring. You can get some modern high, uh, high heat wiring, like what's in this toaster. You could get some of that and redo the wiring inside the toaster. That's getting pretty involved, and honestly, because it doesn't move, and unless you're changing, unless you're fiddling with the wiring, I, that doesn't really bother me, but it would definitely make rewiring it easier. Uh, and yeah, that would, it would be easier to rewire it because you have so little extra wiring in here that unless you can get the original butt connector off, which I was able to on this one, this was the first one I did. I was able to wiggle those butt connectors off wiggle those butt connectors oh my god but anyway if you can get those butt connectors off it's not as bad because you have the room but if you have to cut them like we did for this one then uh you have almost no extra wiring in there so that's a bummer but yeah if you can get your hands on one of these toasters uh i think they're pretty neat the newer versions it, so basically i would say if you're concerned about safety in using these toasters i would get one of the newer ones that has a slider because that double pull switch means it doesn't really need to be a polarized plug. And also part of why I was curious about that was uh, the website Automatic Beyond Belief made it seem like they say they never had a polarized plug. And so I thought, well, there, something must have changed because this original design in 1997 or even probably even to the 70s wouldn't pass UL certification, I think, with a single pull switch. So definitely that did get fixed. So the fact that it doesn't have a polarized plug isn't necessarily terrible. It is on these older ones. The T35 and older make it a polarized plug. At the very least, I would suggest making it a grounded plug. But the newer designs, they're, they're pretty okay. Anyway, thanks for watching.